from South Africa and India has gone ahead. 60 countries of the South have already supported. We are already today morning hearing the news of uh, UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres supporting the proposal. And he has very categorically today said that the G7, uh, and he was addressing the press conference in London, he said G7 should support TRIPS waiver without any conditionalities. And he also said that we need to realize the complexity of the value chain. And, and his idea was that the technology transfer should be supported by technical assistance. And this would bring the real access that is required. Donations can go only to some extent, but production capacities across the South would be of great significance. President Macron has also supported the idea of TRIPS waiver. He has, day before yesterday, issued a statement supporting South Africa and India's proposal. The only big, I would say, impediment now is Germany. Germany has taken a very strong position against this whole proposal. EU's response, as we discussed last week in this panel, was very, very uh, non-cooperative. So now at the WTO, the tax-based discussions have started. Mm -hmm. What is the role of the South? What kind of uh, support majors academics can take is, is something that is uh, going to be of great significance for us. And that's the reason why South Center and RIS have started this series. Last Saturday, we discussed very broad global issues. Today, we are collecting perspectives from Africa. Next Saturday, we would be in Latin American region and we would hear our subject experts from Latin America. And that would be on 19th of June. And on 20th, uh, ma, uh, ma, uh, the following Saturday, we go uh, to collect perspectives on 26th June from ASEAN. And then the series would be over. The issues, friends, are largely in terms of uh, how WTO is going to adopt to these new realities, what modern world is expecting from them, and how the reform multilateralism with the new support that the US has come up with would look like. But as I said last Saturday, there are five important questions which are there and I would very much like to place it before the panel and my colleagues here. The first and foremost is uh, 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 the idea of compulsory licensing. The South has proposed to avoid uh, the question of compulsory licensing. And, and we are saying for TRIPS waiver, which is also for limited time, it's not for long. So compulsory licensing as a solution uh, is not an option. And we have tried to go beyond that so that we do not create distortions in the market. The second is the fact that we need to have moral compass on the table. TRIPS waiver is not a charity. How this should be viewed? What is the associated geopolitics with this? The third point that I want to make here is about the revised proposal that has come from South Africa and India. Tax-based discussions have started. How South can cooperate, how South can create capacity for tax-based discussions among the Southern countries. Now, the number is already touching 60. Fourth, how to deal with complex value chain the mRNA, the access to raw material. So TRIPS waiver alone would not help. We would have to see how mRNA landscape of patents is going to be helpful, how the raw material access is going to be helpful, etc. And last is in terms of the financial support. Several thought leaders have also been invited to G7, and one of them uh, is the head of the IMF. The new window that IMF is expected to create for supporting global vaccination program requires firms to have capacity. There are several South African firms that have come up to undertake the production uh, for vaccines. They require money to be invested in for uh, ramping up the production capacities. So this requires support and this requires ability to take the cause forward. 
these are the five questions friends i feel uh, we would be taking up addressing i do not want to preset the framework but these are just some pointers which speakers and the chair may kindly consider now with these words i once again very warmly welcome each one of you and would like to now invite my my fellow co-host and one of in world's leading authority on intellectual property rights head of the south center mm -hmm. professor carlos coria uh, for his words of welcome professor carlos coria you have the floor carlos well, th thank you uh, thank you much Martin, for these kind words it's always a, a real pleasure to work with you and with the uh, ris as i said the other day one of the most important think tanks in the south so it's real pleasure and certainly this topic is very important for all developing countries uh, so I will not add to the questions that you have just made, but I would like to highlight the role that African countries have had in shaping the intellectual property system under the TRIPS agreement. As you, as you well know, uh, the African group was instrumental and was the key actor in, uh, in getting the Doha declaration on the TRIPS agreement on public health. It was because of the situation in South Africa and other countries in Africa, as you may recall, with the HIV AIDS that led the African group to take a very, a very positive and, and a strong role. And then this led to the adoption of uh, the Doha Declaration, which we celebrate, in fact, 20 years from the adoption of the, since the adoption of the Doha Declaration this year. So the African group has been very active and uh, it has been able to shape in in this in, in connection in particular with access to medicines the the understanding of the trips agreement secondly uh, as you may also recall the african group was also very important in blocking the attempts by developed countries to uh, amend article 273b as you uh, as you know that article 273b contains a, a review provision that was meant to be done within five years of the adoption or entry into force of the TRIPS agreement. And it was because the African group submitted a very, a very well thought proposal about making the exceptions for plants and animals mandatory and not just uh, facultative that the, this whole thing was blocked. And then the, the intent of uh, Japan, United States and others to bring in the new pop standards for plants was actually uh, not, not possible. Uh, so I think there again, the African group has shown leadership and was able to, uh, to help shaping an international regime for intellectual property, which is flexible in particular in relation to plant varieties, which are so important for agricultural production in Africa and in other countries. And then more recently, again, uh, Africa has shown through uh, the South African government with his own proposal with India, again, leadership in this area. And as we know, the African group has been very supportive of this proposal, is one of the important sponsors. And then again, uh, the, the outcomes will be very much dependent on the role that the African group would play in these so-called text-based negotiations. So my hope is that the African group would continue to play this important role. I'm, I'm very confident this will be the case. Of course, one, one, of, the, one of the outcomes that we expect in relation to these text-based negotiations is to have a waiver which is, which is straightforward, which is not subject to conditions. As we know, when the so-called paragraph six uh, solution was negotiated, the United States was able to impose a large number of very cumbersome conditions for the functioning of the system, which is now incorporated as uh, Article 31B in the TRIPS agreement. This should not happen again. The waiver should not be subject to such conditions that will make it impossible to be used. And also, as we may recall, this expeditious solution that was requested in paragraph six of the Doha Declaration took uh, one year and a half at least to be obtained. And this cannot, cannot be repeated again in this situation. There is a need to, to get the waiver soon, as soon as possible, because the pandemic requires uh, emergent solutions. So we cannot wait for such a long time. But then my my, my, my confidence is, is, is really full on, on the, the work that the African group can do in uh, helping to shape, again, a uh, solution for this pandemic and, and maybe for future pandemic. Of course, negotiations will be complex. We already know this not productive 
submission by the European Union, as you say, maybe Germany is, is very much behind that. But uh, I think that with the participation of the African group and other developing countries, we can reach the the required outcome out of this negotiation. Well, thank you very much again, so, Jean, Thank you very much for the for the, to the chair and to the and to the speakers for these uh, very distinguished speakers we have. This is a real privilege to have you, and also thank you for the participants to join us again. Uh, so I'm sure that there will be a very productive discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Carlos, for uh, reminding us of history and the uh, pioneering role that Africa has uh, contributed through and has uh, led the global narrative on on uh, intellectual property rights and 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 access as as one of the major milestones. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Uh, let me now uh, uh, hand it over to. Uh, uh, chair for today, uh, uh, Dr. Sanusha Naidu uh, from Institute uh, uh, for Global Dialogue in, in, in Pretoria. Uh, uh, Dr. Naidu is one of the leading researchers uh, in, in South Africa on uh, Africa's political economy and, and development. Uh, she has been working very closely with emerging powers, uh, particularly the groupings like BRICS and, uh, and, and EPSA. She's also one of the leading commentators on foreign policy. Uh, and uh, and working very closely with uh, uh, several institutions in Africa and outside, uh, uh, she has extensively published uh, uh, with uh, 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 with University uh, of uh, KwaZulu Natal Press and has also contributed uh, through several media writings and uh, uh, research papers, which are brought out by several institutions. Has been frequent commentators on several. Uh, uh, TV channels uh, like Al Jazeera, CCTV, uh, BBC News, and uh, many others. Uh, uh, she is also a regular uh, analyst for South Africa's uh, domestic uh, uh, political and electoral trends, uh, has been one of the pioneers on South South cooperation and how South African foreign policy uh, uh, looks at uh, the African engagement. So, so we are extremely privileged to have you with us, Anusha, today to, to chair the session. Uh, let me hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Session. Uh, good afternoon to my colleagues, um, participants, and everyone who's joining us around uh, the world, I think, for this very, very timely, important, and strategic discussion on the TRIPS waiver uh, proposal. I, I, I just want to say that, you know, it comes at a very, very critical time as we move within the context of how to deal with pandemics and not just pandemics in terms of health pandemics, but just pandemics in general. And I think the discussion we, that, that I listened to uh, last week, that um, session you hosted, um, was really ripe, uh, a very ripe discussion and very important discussion in terms of where we are going. So I don't want to re you know, reiterate or repeat what has been said. I think the 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 opening remarks by yourself and Carlos have been really important in understanding the contextual understanding of what's happening, but also the value chain of geopolitics and how that plays out in the context of the reform agenda of the multilateralism and how this TRIPS waiver issue would actually be a litmus test for that going forward. So a few comments uh, just as an opening discussion before I, we, we start off with the panel that we that are so graciously Generate, uh, generously given their time on a weekend uh, to be with us today and to share their insights and perspectives. Um, I think that the real, the real question we should be thinking about is the role of the continent. And I think what Carlos said really importantly about how, how the, the continent has that kind of intellectual power in shaping the proposal and, and, and the way it shapes international institutions, uh, whether it's in the WTO, whether it's in the G77. And I think on that basis, looking at the, the perspective of the continent within the context of South-South cooperation, but also within the continent context of North-South cooperation as well, and how that defines and drives the discussion going forward. I think what's, what's really interesting about this debate happening now is as Africa is going through its own kind of reform agenda, both at an institutional level, but also in the context of the ratification of the African Free Trade Continental Agreement uh, and looking at that 
a continental agreement and how important that continental agreement is for boosting intra-Africa trade, but also in the context of intra-African value chains, production capacities, uh, production capabilities and resources, and also the importance of that in terms of an equitable distribution of resources in terms of access and strengthening our institutional architecture, both in the context of the continental public health framework and, and, and resources, but also in terms of this, the, the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. And I think those, those kinds of convergences that we see in the continent around the architecture and how this plays out is going to be critical for the role that the, 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 the African group, as well as the broader African civil society and uh, the multiple tracks of diplomacy that we have between uh, track one, track two, 1 1.5, etc., are going to be important in understanding the conditions that exist in the continent for moving this discussion forward and building up a very, very important narrative, but also an important space that allows people, civil society, community based groups as well to also influence the space around this trips waiver and how important it is. And I think also within this context is looking at the regional economic communities and the role that regional economic communities like uh, the Southern African Development Community or the economic community of West African states, as well as the East African bloc. Uh, together with others are going to play critical roles in terms of realizing the potential and, and actually actualizing the operational dynamics of what the strips waiver means in both the legal frameworks of the of the continent, but also at domestic level of legislation frame legislative frameworks as well. And I think to a large extent, carrying that the, the, the dynamics from the from the from the global to the continental to the regional, but also to the national and the local. And I think those are the spaces we have to think about. And then finally, I think just to make the point about the proposal and the impact this has for uh, the, the, the value chain in Africa, but also the value chain for, I think, what is a very interesting point made in last week's discussion, and that was, what is the proposal seeking to do once you start thinking about the negotiating of the text and the consensus that the text needs to bring? I think you mentioned that session in your opening remarks around the five uh, questions. And I think that's a kind of underlying current in terms of how do you, how do you bring that proposal and make it relevant for the continent and how it boosts the continent's access to, 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 to medicines, but also the productive capacities. But more importantly, I think it's also about finding a consensus in the continent as well around the TRIPS waiver proposal that de defines the voice and, and what Africa sees as a critical space in its competitive advantage within this context. So having laid out that kind of role uh, that is important to understand. I just want to also say that um, as we go into this discussion, I, I think that uh, a lot of this is going to be also around understanding the domestic or the continental landscape within this proposal and how much of the voice of different actors are coming in, apart from just industry actors, but also the civil society and, and, and what they see as important points of consensus to drive this process forward. Without further ado, let me just uh, also thank my panelists for, 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 for being here and for, for going to be sharing their views. And I want to start off with uh, Professor Faisal Isma, who is the director of the Mandela School of Public Affairs based at UCT, University of Cape Town. Uh, Faisal has a PhD from the University of Manchester. He served as South Africa's uh, permanent ambassador to the uh, representative ambassador to the WTO from 2010 to 2014. He is currently uh, also serving a being reappointed as the chair of the International Trade and Administration Commission from 2019 to 2023. He has, he has been the chief negotiator for South Africa since 1994. He had also served as a special envoy for South Africa-US relations from 2015-2016. And of course, he is now working very closely with the, second, with the, uh, the, the African uh, Free Trade Agreement uh, Secretariat in Ghana. Uh, the, the Secretariat head is his close friend, so I see very, very interesting dynamics emerging there. Um, and I think the, the, the role that South Africa, uh, the role that 
the Mandela School plays and the work that uh, Professor Ismail is doing, I think gives us a greater understanding of the perspective around these pr production capacities, both from not just a kind of technical assessment, but also from an identional kind of point of view. So Faisal, thank you so much for making time to be here this afternoon. Uh, you have about 10 to 15 minutes um, and please feel free to take the floor. I'll, I'll probably just uh, give you a note when, when you're coming up to your time limit. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to Sanusha for this invitation and uh, such a great privilege for me to be with you, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi. I've had a long association with RIS since the very beginning, <laughs> talking about uh, 20 years, so it's been a long time <laughs> since we have been uh, working together on this. Um, and my good friend, uh, Carlos Correa, who is a giant really in um, on intellectual property rights and a giant also in uh, providing uh, support, technical support to developing countries. And the South Center uh, um, has been, uh, uh, I think, a, a, the foremost thinker, think tank in the world for developing countries on trade and development issues. So thank you so much um, for, for the invitation. Um, I will uh, try to share my perspective on uh, the questions you have raised, uh, Professor uh, Chaturvedi, as I, I proceed. Uh, of course, this time I'm speaking not uh, as a government official or uh, an ambassador, but simply as a, a humble academic, <laughs> a member of civil society. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the background and the context uh, of this particular uh, campaign in Geneva. As you know, uh, COVID-19 has exposed the asymmetries and imbalances of our world. When the 39 big pharma companies took Nelson Mandela's government to court in 1998, because we dared to import AIDS drugs, as this was a global pandemic affecting Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we dared to import these drugs at cheaper prices under parallel imports that are provided for in the TRIPS agreement. It exposed the inequity and the imbalance of the patent system and the WTO agreement on the TRIPS agreement. During the public protests and negotiations on the TRIPS and public health that followed, the representative of the Vatican in the WTO argued that the patent system was a social mortgage that created both rights and responsibilities. Society creates a privilege of market exclusivity for right holders and, return, and in return, there are expectations that these privileges will not be abused to prevent access and affordability of essential drugs for the poor. In the wake of this protest by civil society and developing countries, several global commissions were created and Carlos Correa served on a few of these commissions. And in essence, these commissions called for three important changes. They first, they called for global health to be treated as a systemic issue. They saw the linkage between public health, global economic growth, sustainable development and global security. And above all, they called for global health to be treated as a human right. Secondly, these commissions regarded the patent system with suspicion because developing countries um, that um, were forced to adopt the trips and public health in the Uruguay round resisted this um, for a number of years because um, most of the pharma patents um, were owned by developing country multinational companies. And these companies were uh, highly concentrated in their home markets. Of course, they were challenged even in their own markets by generic companies, by poor people, pensioners and NGOs due to the exorbitant pricing and they were taken to court uh, on several occasions on competition grounds. 
this type of inequity was to become globalized after the Euro round. And Jagdish Bhagwati, a famous uh, professor of, uh, on trade, called this the legitimization of the GATT to extract royalty payments for multinational companies. At the time, he estimated this to be about $40 billion a year that was going from developing countries to the developed world. Thirdly, investments by major pharma companies went to profit-making drugs and diseases of rich countries with very little investment going to the diseases of the poor, such as TB, malaria, and AIDS drugs. A major review of how government funds R&D and public health diseases was therefore called for, and these commissions all call for this review. COVID-19 has brought all these debates back on our agenda. And this time we have to address the question of the relationship between public health research and development and patents and whether this system is working to address systemic issues such as global health and global crisis such as the current uh, pandemic. COVID-19 brings back the issue that made us call for the review of the TRIPS agreement in 2001 when we uh, agreed in Doha to the declaration on TRIPS and public health. When we got back to Geneva, the text-based negotiations began. There was a debate about the TRIPS provisions, whether it should be Article 30 or Article 31F, or what was the best way to create flexibility. Developed countries demanded that compulsory licenses should have strict conditions and safeguards. And therefore, we had the wording in Article 31 bis, which as Carlos Correa correctly says, made these flexibilities cumbersome, complex, and unworkable. Most countries did not use this flexibility, also due to power relations. The US Section 301 and even the AGOA conditionalities in Africa ensured that major players prevented African countries or, and other developing countries from using these flexibilities. However, the protests and negotiations on trips and public health did succeed, in my view, in doing at least three things. First, it brought to the fore the inequity of the patent system and the inadequacy of the global funding for global public health. Second, the TRIPS, the TRIPS agreement was clearly shown to be imbalanced in favor of big pharma, and it was clearly an inadequate response to global public health issues. Thirdly, the negotiations did put pressure on big pharma to reduce prices. And Brazil, for example, succeeded in negotiating reduced prices for AIDS drugs from Merck, from Roche, Abbott Laboratories, and Gilead. So the current South Africa-India waiver for COVID <clears throat> is a, um, a return to a similar debate. I want to firstly pay tribute to the South Africa-India partnership. And I have worked myself in support of this partnership with some outstanding ambassadors in Geneva from India, like K.M. Chandrasekhar, Ujjal Bhatia, and Jayant Dasgupta, who was on your last panel. I want to also salute Ambassador Tolelwa Mlumbi Peters for her sterling work in Geneva and my good friend, Ambassador Xavier Karim, the Deputy DG for Trade in Pretoria. I have seen the revised submission of the South Africa-India submission, supported by over 60 other developing countries. I think it is correct for India and South Africa to call for a waiver for all health products and technologies, as is now called for, for the prevention, treatment, or containment of COVID-19. The submission is pragmatic and directed at the COVID emergency. It is time bound, uh, three years, and also can be reviewed. The pandemic has made clear, and the WTO reminds us every day, 
that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. It reminds us, therefore, of the systemic nature of the health crisis. The cost to the global economy of the current pandemic is immense. Global lockdowns have created economic crisis around the world, particularly amongst the poorest countries in Africa who are suffering the most. Africa, of course, is dependent <clears throat> on other countries for its health needs. Nationalism and protectionism was the immediate knee-jerk response of developed countries when the pandemic began. They banned the export of essential drugs, which are much needed in Africa. Africa has only just begun vaccinating its people, as it is at the end of the vaccine's procurement queue. While OECD, many of the OECD countries have purchased two or three times their current needs. Africa imports over 94% of its pharmaceutical needs and produces less than 1% of global vaccines. And a recent study has shown that only 10 countries in Africa have some manufacturing capacity in pharmaceuticals. Mostly um, they engage in fill and finish which is only packaging and distributing for big pharma. The African Union and its leaders are very aware of this, and they have declared that this dependence is a colonial relationship and undermines Africa's health security. African countries are very aware that they need to build their own production capacity on pharmaceuticals and healthcare products, and, I, and are working on this as a matter of high priority. The African continental free trade area is an exciting process that is building regional integration and cooperation in Africa. And the vision of its leaders is that it, is, it will also facilitate and stimulate manufacturing capabilities in Africa and regional values, value chains. Pharmaceuticals and vaccine production and healthcare products are a very high priority of the African continental free trade area. Finally, I want to say that COVID-19 has called on all of us for bold new approaches to the global crisis based on the values of solidarity and cooperation. The current global system of governance, health in health, on trade, and also on environment and climate is clearly not fit for purpose. It is South-South partnerships like this, starting with South Africa and India, Asia and Africa, together with our BRICS partners, that could be a first and significant step towards at least a few ways of building this partnership. Firstly, the sharing of technology. Secondly, cooperation on finance. Third, the sharing of experiences in manufacturing. And fourth, joint ventures in R&D and innovation. And fifth, joint ventures in the production of pharma products, vaccines and technologies. This will be, in my view, our best response to the current COVID pandemic and will build resilience against future pandemics. Mr. Chairman, me, <coughs> we in the Mandela School have started a process of dialogue in Africa on the theme, the African continental free trade area and transformative industrialization. We brought together academics, policymakers, the private sector and civil society activists to discuss the COVID-19 pandemic and the creation of pharma and health, healthcare value chains in Africa. I would like to invite you, the RIS, to work with us to extend this conversation to our respective stakeholder communities in both India and Africa. So my message to you today is that this is a very important platform that could um, create uh, a number of new key messages. First, that COVID-19 has exposed the inequities and imbalances of the global system. Second, that we need to change the narrative about public health, trade, development, and human rights. We need to see health as a systemic issue. Governments must regain the responsibility and leadership 
for investment in R&D and innovation for public health diseases and not contract this responsibility out to the private sector. Third, global rules on trade and patent law must reflect this new insight that COVID has brought to the fore on intellectual property rights and trips, which must be at the, services of, of, at the service of humanity and not for big business and profits as president um, uh, as, as the, the president of South Africa, Ramaphosa, has recently said. Building manufacturing capabilities in pharmaceuticals and healthcare in developing countries, especially in Africa, is essential for our health resilience and health security globally. And Mr. Chairman, as I've said, South-South cooperation and building a global alliance with civil society organizations is our best way forward to achieve these objectives. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Faisal. That was a good, I mean, you've given us such a great start to this uh, conversation, this discussion today. I think I really enjoyed the way you tied in the fact that there's a need to reevaluate the narrative around public health, uh, intellectual property rights, patency, human rights, and coming back to the question of just humanity for if all are safe, then everybody is safe. But if one is not safe, then nobody is safe. And I think that's the that's a key dynamic of this whole dis discussion. But also, I think the key dynamic that I take away is that this is not something that just emerges. It has been emerging for a long time, and COVID has exposed the equities of a, a global system where the challenges around power dynamics and, and the role of multinationals and how you deal with the value chain is very important. So I think you've set a tone for the rest of your colleagues to come. And um, without further ado, let me introduce you, introduce uh, the, uh, the, the colleagues to Professor Yusuf Vauder. Uh, just to say that both uh, Faisal and Yusuf come from my alma mater, which is the University of Durban Westfall. So it's fantastic to see uh, colleagues of mine who have been before me at UDW and where they are now. So Professor Vauder is a senior research associate in the School of Law. He holds uh, academic qualifications, an undergrad uh, in, in, in Bachelor of Arts and Law, and as well as a doctorate in law, which he obtained from the University of Durban Westfall. What he's a qualified uh, uh, admit, uh, uh, attorney admitted in, in, in the High Court of South Africa. He's practiced from 1978 to 1994. And thereafter, he took up a position as a director of the law clinic, uh, a position which he has held from 94 to 2003, and thereafter went on to become a, an academic in the law school at University of Durban Westfall. Uh, he has various, he sits on various boards, including the Legal Aid uh, uh, of South Africa, the council, a member of the Members Control Council, as well as the chair of the Legal Committee. He has been, a, he's also been a founding trustee of the Association of University Legal Aid Institutions, and his research in, uh, interests include clinical law and legal aid services, as well as professional training, HIV AIDS, human rights law, bioethics and law. And of course, the human uh, what we've been discussing and, and the whole debate around the human rights, intellectual property and access to medicines. He has provided technical assistance in several in, in initiatives to medical uh, to reform medicines regulation systems, as well as intellectual property rights in South Africa, across the continent to various countries, as well as the AU. So, Professor Vauda, I hand over to you and again, 10 to 15 minutes and. Uh, I basically will just let you know when you're coming up to that mark. Oh, uh, thank you, Sanusha, um, for that very generous introduction. I must say, I don't quite recognize myself when you talk like that, pardon me. Um, and my warm greetings to my uh, fellow panelists um, and to everyone who's joined us on this webinar. Uh, and my thanks to RIS and South Center for inviting me to contribute today. So I'm going to talk first about two sets of challenges facing Africa, and then I'm going to uh, touch on the relevance of the waiver uh, that is before the WTO at the moment. And in the course of that, I hope that I will uh, address uh, some of the issues raised by professors Tatul Bedi and Faria, uh, and uh, perhaps round up the discussion. So let me start the first set of challenges with this proposition. That is that Africa's challenges 
are both historical and contemporary. I say historical because the origin of the very intellectual property laws that you know we in Africa are contending with and implementing and so on, and indeed all laws, were colonial impositions. Uh, with the independence that African countries attained, those uh, laws didn't go away. The design of the colonial legal systems was hardwired into the DNA of the colonies. It remained, became entrenched, and has become very difficult to dislodge, as many of us uh, legal scholars will, will attest. But this does not relate only to the laws, but also to the institutions that were built during that time. And these include the practices, the education and training of bureaucrats, as well as the judges who adjudicate for example, IP related cases today, all of them schooled in the colonial style. So that is the backdrop against which we started off implementing uh, intellectual property rules. So when the shift came, in other words, when the Uruguay round found that the intellectual property regime was being moved into the trade agenda, uh, African countries were very ill prepared to resist this further encroachment, if you like, on the commons that had been hardwired and set in stone. So that's so much for the history. In terms of the contemporary situation with African countries, of course, uh, we've heard in the previous uh, seminar and in many webinars that are happening that uh, there are public health flexibilities that are available within the TRIPS agreement that could be utilized and so on. And there's a lot of work that has been done around this, of course, and I won't go there and repeat all of those. Uh, but I think there are many reasons why this has not really worked. And I think uh, previous uh, speakers have already alluded to uh, the narrative being one that is actually, you know, use these particular flexibilities, but nobody is accepting or interrogating why these uh, flexibilities have not been adopted or they're not really working. So, and, and, and I'll uh, traverse some of that sort of ground here. First, I think is that I think many African countries experience the lack of legal and technical expertise or the infrastructure and resources to implement a, a functional and let's uh, say a pro-public interest and public health type of system. And this is evident from the kind of resources that are need to, needed to set up a substantive examination system, for example, of patents and, and other kinds of uh, intellectual property, uh, or for the kinds of systems that are needed to consider and assess compulsory license applications. So these are deficits that have, have to be continued with. The second, as Faisal has already alluded to, are uh, reasons why these flexibilities have not been uh, adopted is the trade and other pressures by high income countries not to use uh, these flexibilities. And we know that these happen in many and very various insidious forms. And the best example of this is, of course, the free trade agreements, where developing countries are frequently pressured not to you know, uh, apply flexibilities, but in fact, to impose higher protections for intellectual property, what are known as TRIPS Plus. And this, of course, is a factor of the way in which the intellectual property system has worked and has increased the levels of protection progressively as uh, more and more agreements are entered into and so on. And then still on the question of these pressures are the threats of legal actions and economic sanctions that you would find. Again, this was alluded to previously about the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association case against the South African government way back. Um, but of course, in the case of the US, every year the US cites countries on their 301 watch list in terms of the Trade Act, uh, where they identify countries as, as, as uh, you know, uh, bad examples of what should not be happening. And here, of course, India has often uh, received this uh, dubious honor of being on the watch list several times, and many, and some African countries too. Uh, then I think one must also say that it's just not only a one-sided, you know, pressure from high-income countries. I think that some of our governments are also complicit in, uh, you know, not taking the, the, the you know, uh, issue by the scruff of the neck. They have been, you know, uh, eradicating. They have uh, not displayed the correct political will to do the best thing for their countries. And this is part of the reason that we are we have these difficulties. And I think we have to be honest in our analysis 
of you know, how this has rolled out. But specifically in relation to the flexibility and in relation to how uh, these pose, the lack of use of these pose challenges to African countries, is the um, role and the, in the space of the regional intellectual property organizations in Africa. Now, as many of you would know, Africa has two uh, major IP organizations, regional organizations, uh, one for the English speaking countries and the other one for predominantly the French speaking countries. Uh, Repo is the former and ORP is the second one, and they both uh, translate to being African regional intellectual property organizations. Unfortunately, these the regional organizations, which perhaps in their intent, you know, under the organization of African unity and the various Harare protocols and Banduri and so on, were meant to assist countries. But I think in their practice, they have uh, lost the plot. Their work has been weighted in favor of protection of holder rights rather than the supportive role that they were intended to play to member countries. So in effect, they have downplayed flexibilities in terms of public health, but rather promoted enforcement measures uh, as is, you know, the, the, the demand pretty much for high income countries and so on. But the best example of this uh, is uh, of how the regional organizations don't really work in favor of countries is uh, the following. Uh, there isn't really a significant full substantive examination that takes place of the patents, patent applications that um, these two regional organizations uh, consider and evaluate. Right? Uh, so that's a significant uh, problem. But in addition to that, they have not utilized the opportunity to allow for opposition procedures where people with a proper interest, and particularly those representing the public interest, can come forward and say, this is why we should not run this particular way. So I think there they have failed us very, very badly. There's um, studies which have cited that Repo uh, and ORP are not quite fit for purpose. And I think I've alluded to some of the design issues that indicate why they don't sort of work that well. But I mean, I think the results are, are pretty problematic as well. Uh, Repo, for example, uh, grants patents, um, and the, these patents uh, have to be, um, well, they become applicable in the Repo members unless they opt out within the six month period. Now, we know that in bureaucracy and so on, this does not really work well. And with the result that many countries end up adopting and accepting patents, patent protection uh, by default virtually. So, you know, that, that, that becomes a problem. And of course, in the case of OWAPI, it's probably a lot worse. What happens here is that member countries are governed by a single regional statute. Uh, and that once that ORP passes that uh, particular patent application, it becomes applicable in every one of the 17 member countries. And this, despite the fact that 13 of those 17 member countries are least developed countries who should not be obliged to respect, respect those patents in terms of the trips rule. Right? I mean, this is really the, 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 the measure of the problem. Now, in terms of the use of uh, and of, of the adoption of flexibilities, international law, and the use of these flexibilities, they have been a very limited use in Africa. Uh, we have seen a surge of activity around the early 2000s. Uh, in a study we conducted, uh, which looked at this question and other questions in terms of use of flexibilities in Africa, and which was published by the South Center last year, we reported that these uses uh, occurred during the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And at this time, some 28 of the these development countries did use the uh, LDC transition flexibility to import ARs. A few others used some form of government use provision. And of course, most of the ARs were supplied by Indian manufacturers. And of course, this was possible because of the limited window that we had, the lim limited window of opportunity that was available until 2005, when after which India was required to grant product patents and medicines. So, you know, I think. Barring that sort of surge of activity, there was, wasn't very much happening in terms of the use of the system. So that brings me to the second set of challenges related to the very issues of the flexibilities that people are saying they're not using and why they're not being used. Right? So why do the existing measures, voluntary and compulsory licenses, uh, not work? Firstly, uh, intellectual property, right, property rights holders refuse to grant voluntary licenses 
unless it suits their purposes entirely. So, so they would grant it on a limited basis with stringent conditions regarding supply of markets and so on. And the worst thing, what is, of course, is that they're secret. So nobody knows what's going on. There's a complete lack of transparency. And if one were to scrutinize these, uh, as, as some have managed to do, they will likely be found to be anti-competitive and in violation of uh, Article 40 of the TRIPS agreement. So, I mean, that's really the problem of the voluntary license. There's no business happening there that can actually meaningfully, uh, you know, reach, have the kind of reach. And in fact, uh, you know, the, um, the, the uh, very celebrated uh, voluntary license for Endesiva, for example, that, that were given, excluded the majority of, uh, you know, middle income countries. And, and that was just not a workable thing. Uh, I won't go into the issue of compulsory licenses in any detail, but of course, everybody knows this, that you know, they have to be applied for on a case by case, product by product basis. And, you know, applicants won't know oh, how many patents are on a single product, uh, and that would end up being a cause of, cause of uh, protracted and expensive judicial processes, which will, you know, really bankrupt small competitor companies, essentially. For countries that have no or low, little manufacturing capacity, 31 this was put forward, but of course it's been used only once uh, in view of the virtually unworkable uh, regime that has been put in place there. Now, you must remember that all of this, all these supposed flexibilities that could be used but have not been uh, capable of being used are happening in the context of Africa that has very low vaccine manufacturing capacity. Before the COVID uh, uh, pandemic came about, Africa was using 1.3 billion doses of vaccines uh, annually. And this comprised 25% of the global demand for vaccines, pre-COVID, right? That was what it was. But only 12 million of those vaccines were actually manufactured in Africa. And this accounted for 1% of its requirements. As Basil said earlier, 99% of vaccines in Africa have to be imported. That is the uh, measure of the, the Issue we have here and the challenge in terms of manufacturing. So, to move quickly on the last part, which deals with the relevance of the waiver, of course, uh, it's common knowledge now that co compulsory licenses are not a panacea. It's to do with the complex nature of vaccines, biologics, diagnostics, and so on. Not only are they covered by multiple patents, but they're also covered by additional IP protections like copyrights, industrial designs, trade secrets, manufacturing, know how, and all of those sorts of things. So all of these actually militate against uh, use of these sort of flexibility. So will the waiver help? Yes, certainly the waiver will help. Uh, and how does the waiver help? So I'll just you know, highlight some of the few and then round up. Um, instead of hundreds of actions in different countries, the same effect can be achieved by a single action of the WTO. This is what, what the waiver is trying to do. The waiver can effectively uh, provide a blanket suspension of all relevant IP protections, as uh, the proponents of the waiver are asking. Uh, what's important is that it could provide legal cover and removes the threat of action at the WTO dispute settlement body. So countries can't be hauled over to the WTO and say, are you violating trips, uh, provisions and so on. It could minimize the threats of trade retaliation against individual countries. It takes the pressure of developing countries and LDCs to initiate action, like voluntary licensing or compulsory licensing. But I think this is a very important caveat. Countries will have to domesticate the um, provisions of the waiver as they are applicable to them. They will not be self-effectuating, uh, and this you know, will require some kind of uh, domestic legislative action. Uh, the revised waiver proposal was referred to, so I won't go into that. Uh, but just to say that the waiver is necessary and vital, uh, but it still could be improved, improved. And I think there are a couple of areas where uh, the, the waiver seems to you know, appear to have some gaps. One was, of course, raised last week in, in the discussion, and that is that it does not provide any compulsion on intellectual property rights holders to cooperate. So, sure, the countries might sign up to the waiver, and the provision will be there. But uh, what is, you know, will they come to the party? So I think for, for this reason, I really think it needs to be introduced in terms of the strong language requiring them to commit to disclose fully, to share their manufacturing know-how, to effect technology transfer and so on. And then, of course, the second part of it and the other side to the point would be that countries must compel industry uh, in the, to, to commit their IP and their know-how to the uh, COVID-19 technology access pool. 
facility to enable rapid scale-up. Because uh, without that, it's not going to be possible to uh, you know ramp up production and to make sure that the vaccines and other technologies reach people. So, in conclusion, the waiver is important, but it is a limited intervention. Right? It is a lim intervention which is purely within the context and the parameters of the existing WTO role, rules in the TRIPS agreement. It is necessary to grant us uh, get us through the crisis. But I think we must also acknowledge that in the, the last month, nine, nine months have shown that the multilateral system introduced by the WTO reinforces the colonial character of intellectual property protection. In the final analysis, high-income countries call the shots. They can block consensus and act as an effective veto in the deliberations. And we are hoping this will not happen now, but we shouldn't be surprised if it happens. What this does is reinforce the inequality between developed and developing world. So effectively, this system has failed poor people all over the world. What is required is an effective decolonization of this model. Uh, very nice catch word, right? We need to um, continue this conversation about how we will free ourselves of this model, as we have seen during this pandemic. It's not de uh, delivering equitable access. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Vada. I think you've given us quite an important uh, scope of the institutional landscape in Africa. Uh, I really think the idea that you have two regional intellectual property organizations governing the architecture of the institutional landscape when it comes to patents and, and, and trips and, and, and issues of that nature um, really requires a serious deliberation in the continent as well. And more importantly, I think the point you made about the domestication of provisions of the waiver with regard to whether it's at a regional level, whether it, it's a discussion happening at the AU, as well as at national level, I think is very important for us to consider because it also gives us uh, more, more understanding around the contextual uh, analysis of what does the international architecture on trips do in, in the context of uh, not just Africa, but I think across the globe where you have similar trajectories in, in, in whether it's in Asia or whether it's in uh, South America or Latin America around these provisions and how will they be domesticated. So thank you very much for that. And I think there's going to, definitely going to be a lot of questions in the in the chat room and, and as well as um, in the Q&A section on these issues as we move forward. Uh, let me go on to our next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Amaka Vani, who's based at the School of Law. Uh, Un University of Leeds. Uh, she has uh, she she's basically uh, a specialist in, inter in intellectual patents. She's she's got a, she's worked in um, various capacities with regard to the framing and responses of national implementation of inter in international patent law, and basically has an award winning book called Patent Games in the Global South: Pharmaceutical Patent Law Making in Brazil, India, and Nigeria. And I think what's important is that it brings together very nicely uh, the, the work that Dr. Vani play, uh, has, has done and is doing uh, with the previous discussions that we've been having in this arena. She has a PhD and LNM degrees from International Economic Law from the University of Warwick. Uh, she was awarded her, uh, her PhD 2018 with the Seal Hearts Prize in International Economic Law. She's also the president or is the current president of the African International Economic Law Network and is a contributing editor to the Africa AfronomicsLaw.org, a leading blog on the international economic law landscape as it relates to Africa and the global south. Dr. Vani, the floor is yours, 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you very much um, for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Great. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Um, South Center is um, one of those organizations that I refer to continually in my work. And Professor Korea is one of the um, big role models I have um, going into academia, um, actually in the area of intellectual property law. Um, so. Um, for this conversation, uh, I would like to quickly touch on three topics. Uh, the first one will be on the capacity limitation to the use of the um, chips waiver. And then also uh, I'll be speaking on um, 
complementary measures needed in addition to the TRIPS waiver to um, help upscale manufacturing in Africa. Um, and also, I'll briefly touch on the, um, the LDC issue. Um, I think I will start first with the, the, the complementary, uh, complementary measures with regards to uh, TRIPS, uh, TRIPS waiver. So one of the key lessons from this pandemic is that availability does not translate to access for all, even in the even in a global pandemic. Um, in a few months, we've seen COVID-19 um, morph into a from a global to a regional pandemic. So while most people in Europe and the US are getting vaccinated and moving on to normal living, in other parts of the world, in Brazil, in India, in Nepal, in many parts of Africa. COVID is still causing um, daily death and pain. This pandemic, if anything, right, has taught us that, um, has taught us about the need to democratize pharmaceutical manufacturing. So for so long, uh, developed countries have ignored their obligations under TRIPS agreements um, with regards to technological um, tech transfer. And even when tech tra um, technology um, has been transferred via voluntary agreements, Undisclosed um, licensing terms covering patents and other IP rights typically restrict how transfer technology can be used, the extent and the destination of the products produced under such agreements. So if you take the, the GILID um, voluntary agreement for the hepatitis C medicine as an example, you could see even in that agreement, Brazil and Ukraine and other middle income countries um, were excluded. And these are the countries with high um, hepatitis C burden. Then, of course, you have the CTAP and the COVAS facility. But as we are all aware, the CTAP has not um, gained momentum and the COVAX facility is severely underfunded. And so this is why um, the original proposal put forward by India and South Africa, which, um, um, as we know, the TRIPS waiver um, is important because as a, um, it is a whole package that includes tech, not only the suspension the temporary suspension, because we need to reemphasize that the temporary suspension of intellectual property rights, but it also includes tech transfer and disclosing of trade secrets and data. So with regards to the continent, um, as my uh, co-panelists have mentioned, um, Africa produces only 1% of the vaccine it administers. The remaining 99% are imported. So to boost manufacturing from this 1% to 60%, um, to 60% um, the continent needs um, financing amounting to millions of dollars. The continent needs to expand research capacity. It needs a commitment from government to purchase vaccines, and it needs regulatory bodies to meet international standards. Currently, the continent has around four vaccine manufacturers. You have the Pasteur Institute in, in Dakar, Senegal, um, in Tunis, in um, Tunisia, in Algiers, Algeria, and also BioVac in Cape Town. And these companies, they have, um, man, um, they have the capacity to manufacture the substance that a vaccine is made of. Um, there is also a very limited upstream production with regards to local companies only engaging in packaging and labeling, and occasionally the fill and finish steps. So as a result, the continent has limited capacity to repurpose facilities for large scale production through partnership. And at the moment, um, I think it's only the Aspen Pharmaceutical, um, thanks to the license agreement with Johnson & Johnson, is um, expected, is currently engaging in active um, manufacturing and production of COVID vaccine and is expected to produce around 350 million doses of vaccines annually. We, um, and half of these are reserved for exports back to rich countries as part of early purchase agreements. So as you can see, there is need to democratize vaccine and pharmaceutical manufacturing within the continent and to create plat platforms for vaccine production. To, to do this, as I mentioned, the continent not only needs financial assistance, but also mechanisms which trade secrets in the latest vaccine manufacturing know-how can be shared, um, tech transfer and the, 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 the sharing and exchange of related that data. The good thing about endeavors such as this is that it will not only facilitate development of, it will facilitate not, um, not only just the development of vaccines, but also diseases that are prevalent in the continent. Importantly, it could contribute to sustainable supply of both vaccines and other essential medicines, 
um, it will help the continent um, prepare better for future pandemics, which a lot of um, health activists are saying it's going to become a frequent occurrence because of um, global an explosion of global populations and the fact that we are intruding or into um, habitats previously un unhabited by us humans. And also, um, it will also help in the development of products at tailored to African context. Of course, there is the added benefit of um, increasing high skilled employment, indirectly developing the general manufacturing um, sector. The thing is, um, all this requires both um, joint action by both international community, regional actors within the continent, as well as state actors. We cannot discount the value of domestic industrial policies in affecting regional initiatives as this. As I stated in my book, local laws, especially um, local laws play an important role, especially in the development of manufacturing capacity. Um, so when I was doing my field work in Nigeria, one of the things um, I, I came across is how the, the previous industrial policies by the Nigerian government in the 1980s and in the 1990s devastated the country's manufacturing capacity. So it is imperative while we are also clamoring for um, global contribution and action and initiatives, there should also be um, engagement even at the domestic levels for laws to be amended to ensure favorable environment to achieve um, the lofty goals, um, such as the development of vaccine um, capacity. Earlier this year, the good news is that the African Union announced the launch of the, launch of the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing. Uh, the partnership includes two agreements aimed at boosting manufacturing of vaccines across the African continent and to increase the share of vaccines manufactured within the continent from 1% to 60% by 2040. Um, the goals of this partnership, as stated by the um, Africa CDC and the AU, includes um, a coordinated agenda for vaccine manufacturing and the bolstering of five regional production sites over the next 10 to 15 years, um, the mobilization of financial partnership, and the strengthening of regional um, regulatory systems, um, and also to increase technology transfers to manufacturers on the continent. In short, it's 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 uh, a creation of a whole scale, or it's the creation of a whole um, ecosystem with regards to vaccine manufacturing, research, and development. Um, while these systems or while the um, these factors are, are important, there is also the need to create the market for the purchase of these vaccines. As uh, as it stands at the moment, most African countries are supplied with vaccines by UNICEF, supported by Gavi. Um, as the continent has fewer than 10 countries that are self-sufficient in terms of vaccine procurement. So um, when I was in Nigeria um, doing my field work in, in 2015-2016, the pharmaceutical companies I, I interviewed then in, in Nigeria, one of the problems they mentioned to me was the fact that even if the manufacturer um, HIV, first generation HIV medicines in Nigeria, there is no market for them um, to sell these products, mainly because majority of the HIV AIDS vaccines, um, sorry, HIV AIDS medicines used in Nigeria are donated by um, donor organizations and by non-governmental organizations. So you can see how that will create, um, uh, that would discourage potential investors that would like to invest in vaccine in, in manufacturing capacity if there is no market for the products where um, for the products that I produce to be to be to be bought. So um, um so you can see how our public private um, um how public private partnership even though it's important there needs to be um complementary measures within the continent you know with regards to creating markets um, for, for, for these products. And this is really important with regard to vaccines, mainly because the field of vaccines um, is considered unprofitable and unattractive to most players in the biopharmaceutical arena. Um, the nature of vaccine development is such that the, um, as commodified goods, vaccines are of, often regarded as unappealing to investment prospects. This is because the goal of vaccine deployment is preventive, right? And the success in these preventive um, measures um, translates to non-events or the lessening of a, uh, a particular um, outbreak. 
Um, furthermore, vaccines deliver long-term protect protection via single use, while many others require very, very limited number of uses. And so this limited, these limitations are especially striking in the case of vaccines that targeting infectious diseases that are not traditionally um, prevalent in developed countries. So this future severely limits the monetization of vaccines significantly. And so we need to create demand for such vaccines within the continent that even if we are developing and manufacturing and creating vaccines within the continent, right, there needs to be market for this and investors will not invest if they know there is no market for this. So then this raises a question of how do we balance the role and the presence of non-state actors and international NGOs such as Gavis and and and. And, and UNICEF and the important role they play in the continent, as well as the need to win off the continents on the dependence of these um, actors. So to encourage um, local development of vaccines or to encourage the creation of market for the de um, vaccines developed within the continents. And so without the commitment and support to buy vaccines manufactured in Africa, it will remain very difficult challenge to build a sustainable industry capable of producing vaccines at scale. Um, moving on to another topic uh, I would like to briefly touch on, which is the, um, the LDC um, transition period. As we all know, the LDC transition period ends next month. Uh, July 31st, and I would like to briefly touch upon that and it's relevant to the current conversation with regards to the TRIPS waiver. So the trans transition period um, um, is another is an extendable flex um, transition period that is extendable is another flexibility um, available to least developed countries under TRIPS agreements. The flexibility was extended to LDCs, especially because of the multidimensional um, structural constraints they face with such as uh, low, low per capita income, lack of manufacturing capacity, um, considerable health burdens, poor human development. So we must remember that the Doha um, Declaration affirms the rights of these countries not only to implement um, uh, the, uh, the TRIPS agreements in respect to pharmaceutical until, uh, until uh, January, the initial agreement was 1st of January 2016, and the um, the extension was further um, was the transition period was further extended, and um, the it was agreed up until July 21. So by requesting um, an extension of the transition period, it is within the legal mandates um, under the TRIPS agreement, under the developing under the Doha, De, um, Doha declaration, and also if you bear in mind the devastating effects of the pandemic on all countries, especially developed countries, there is need to grant these countries the extension they need. So it not only makes moral sense, but it also makes economic and sustainable development sense to further extend transition period to LDCs, right? So this will not provide, this will um, provide the countries with the policy space to maintain autonomy to determine the appropriate um, development and innovation policies um, according to local needs and priorities. But it will also create um, a space where the countries can sustainably and effectively use um, the, um, uh, affordable COVID medicines and, and vaccines to combat COVID-19 COVID um, within, their, within their countries. And so, um, I don't know, do I still have time or I've run out of time? You have like 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, so that, 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 so let me just wrap up. So that is it. And one more thing, there is this general assumption, right, that um, and you hear it a lot, even with regards to the way um, certain IP scholars and even developed countries discuss the TRIPS waiver and how the TRIPS waiver will be used within the continent. So there is this general assumption that there is capacity limitation, right? But it is not true. History has shown that even within the continent, um, African countries have used um, the, the trips flexibility and if the waiver is granted they will be able they will know how to employ and implement the trips waiver um 
within the continent, there are numerous successful uses of compulsory license or public non-commercial use. It might not be as popular as the Brazilian or Thai cases, but it's still very much important. So you have, for instance, in 2005, the Ghanaian Minister of Health issued a government use compulsory license for the importation into Ghana of Indian HIV AIDS medicines. In the same year, the Ministry of Health of Guinea issued compulsory license for the importation of HIV AIDS in, into Guinea. Eritrea has also um, issued compulsory license for the importation into the country of generic HIV medicines. So we can see these countries are aware and have the capacity to employ this flexibility. So with regards to um, um, with the TRIPS waiver, I believe that the countries within the continent and also with the effective leadership setting um, African actors such as the Africa CDC and the AU has displayed during this COVID pandemic, it's without a doubt that the continent will be able to successfully utilize um, the, the, the policy space um, envisioned within the TRIPS waiver. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vani. I think you've really brought it back to the questions around the market fundamentals, the capacity around the production, uh, but also bringing in the non-state actors and the role that they can play. And of course, uh, a critical issue is industrial capacities, domestic industrial policy, and how much does that enable the conditions for the production and the, the issues around the TRIPS waiver being domesticated within regional markets, national markets, but more importantly, the, the, the demand in the market as well. And of course, giving LDCs a little bit more time in terms of space. Um, really, really important questions that we have to think about, um, not just in the context of Africa, but I think in other regions as well, in terms of ability to adapt to the TRIPS waiver and whatever is negotiated in the text. Um, our last speaker is Dr. Kriti Narse, um, and she's, uh, she's based with the, she has 23 years of experience working in various roles. Uh, in the healthcare industry, and she currently runs her own consultancy focusing uh, on health and trade policy issues in Africa, and currently also completing a PhD in pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical policy at the UCLA University in Netherlands. Prior to this, she served as the Senior Director of Government Affairs and Policy for Sub-Saharan Africa at Johnson & Johnson, and she is also quite uh, an important actor in terms of understanding the dynamics around the interplay between state and, 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 and industry. So, Kirti, you've got 15 minutes. You can go ahead. Thank you, Sanusha, and, and um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, panel discussion this afternoon. So, I think I'm the only non-IP expert here this afternoon. <laughs> Um, I'd like to actually touch on some of the points that you raised, uh, Sanusha, which is around the continental free trade agreement, the production capacities. Uh, you, you also talked about the institutional architectures and uh, the role of the regional economic commu uh, communities, etc. This is something that I've been passionate about for a number of years. How do we actually look at practical implementation of some of these areas. Um, so I think the TRIPS waiver is a very important factor. And one of the questions was around uh, international solidarity. And I think there isn't a more urgent opportunity for us to have global solidarity. But unfortunately, we're just not seeing it. Uh, I think we are seeing it in terms of the support for the TRIPS waiver, which is a very positive aspect. Um, but we need to think about what are we going to do once the TRIPS waiver comes into effect? How are we going to actually practically realize the benefits of that waiver? And how do we create sustainability of the benefits on the African continent? And I think those are really important questions that we need to ask ourselves. And that's where we need to think about the pharmaceutical value chain. And Faisal did touch on that a little bit. And I'm, I'm working quite closely with him and his team to, to really look at how do we think about how the value chain is operating currently? Uh, what effect has the industrial policies that we have in place on the continent? Uh, what benefits have they derived for us? to date, and, and how do we need to be thinking about the value chain going forward? 
especially in the context of the opportunities that the Continental Food Trade Agreement is going to provide us going forward. So just to start off with, um, you know, there's one statistic that I found quite startling, and it, it comes from a parliamentary presentation done in South Africa on the latest status of the waiver. Uh, and, it, and the statistic basically states that by the 30th of May of this year, 1.8 billion doses of vaccines were administered globally. Um, and, and that meant that 426 million people were vaccinated. Uh, and approximately 75% of those vaccines were delivered in only 10 countries. And, you know, those 10 countries were obviously not on the African continent. And that those are startling uh, figures that we really need to be think, uh, thinking about. Um, the previous panel speakers also talked about our very limited manufacturing capacity on the African continent when it comes to vaccine manufacturing. Now, when we talk about manufacturing, we also need to be thinking about what do we mean when we talk about manufacturing? Because we have a very broad definition of manufacturing, and currently that term is used very loosely. Now, in South Africa, we know that vaccines are being manufactured, but it's actually really just the latter part of the value chain that we're focusing on, which is the fill and finish. And, and that doesn't create a lot of technical capability. So we've talked about the waiver in the context of technology transfer. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that context, we also need to be thinking about um, what kind of capacity building is it going to be bringing locally. So if we're only fill filling and finishing, that's not going to create a lot of capacity building in the long run for us locally. And that brings into question what kind of sustainability are we creating? Uh, one of your questions was uh, around the mRNA platforms and the availability of the mRNA platforms. And I actually took the liberty of going to do some research around this. And the mRNA platforms provide quite a cost-effective and transferable platform that can be utilized not only in infectious diseases, but also in non-communicable diseases. And we know that from a disease burden perspective, we have a sharp rise of a disease burden wave in the non-communicable diseases area, like in cancer, diabetes, et cetera. So we have the opportunity to do a lot more innovation and R&D in that space, but that means that we need to be investing in R&D. Uh, and we also need to be looking at how to prevent leakages in our intellectual capital um, so that we are preventing scientists from leaving the, the continent as they do every year. Um, and, and investing in R&D infrastructure so that we can build sustainability in these, in these areas. So that, you know, should we even have tech transfer in these areas, we can fully leverage and op optimize uh, utilizing them. Otherwise, you know, we will really not be leveraging the opportunities to their full extent from a public health perspective. And I think those are some of the practical aspects that we need to be looking at. So our AU member states have committed many years ago to, for instance, spending 1% of GDP on R&D. But we have yet to see any member state even coming close to that R&D spend. Uh, and, and data shows that uh, we are losing one out of three scientists every year out of the continent. So that's a massive loss of intellectual capital that we are losing to the developed world. Um, and, and these are things that we need to be looking at. And the main reasons that they leave is because of lack of access to opportunities, lack of access to research funding, uh, lack of access to even data, research data, something as simple as that. 
um, and and then also research institutions. Uh, you know, so we need to be re-looking at how we invest in that. And you mentioned that in your opening remarks. So that we can actually fully develop what it is that we're going to be getting through technology transfer. And then also looking at the rest of the value chain in terms of how do we then commercialize, uh, get into manufacturing and so on. So the previous speaker also spoke about, you know, access to markets and, and procurement, and that's a very important point that we need to be looking at. Uh, and that brings uh, about the question around regulatory oversight. So we do know that, you know, the treaties around the development of the African Medicines Agency have now been ratified, but we have yet to see um, the actual implementation of the African Medicines Agency, and that also needs to be accelerated. I think it's really positive that we have gotten as far as we have, but again, we need to see acceleration of that so that we have transparency, we have good regulatory oversight, because these large multilateral organizations that do the procurement for these health commodities like UNICEF, Gavi, et cetera, expect a certain global standard in terms of these health commodities that they will purchase in bulk. And if we want to be able to compete in those purchasing agreements, then we have to be able to meet those standards. And it's not like we cannot, we can. Um, but it means that we need to have our house in order. Um, and, and we, you know, we have the ability to do that, but it's a matter of implementation. And I think this is sometimes where we do fall short in terms of getting to implementation. Uh, it does become challenging. I think the sheer number of, of member states um, and the diversity of the region uh, does create complexity. Uh, and that's where the regional economic communities can play such a vital role. Because if we can just get it right within the regions, uh, that in itself is going to create so much more momentum in terms of uh, practical implementation of some of these initiatives. And then, you know, we, we need to also start thinking less from a national perspective and more from a regional and continental perspective if we're going to um, become competitive. And also, if we really mean uh, business when we think about uh, health security, because one of the things that this pandemic has taught us is how much we are externally dependent outside of Africa and how much opportunity at the same time we have to become more inwardly focused in terms of uh, just cooperation amongst member states. And again, you know, coming back to the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it creates that platform for cooperation and collaboration. And then also looking at regional advantages where we can leverage on each other in terms of member states to uh, create uh, efficiencies within the value chain so that we are not replicating and reinventing the wheel. Um, I think that, you know, the pandemic has taught us also that our health systems are extremely fragile. And if we are looking at health delivery, we also need to get our governments to spend more locally on healthcare, to prioritize healthcare as a, as a budget item, a national budget item. And that is extremely important because we've heard from the other speakers about the donor dependency and what an impact that has on, on the local industry as well. And we need to start thinking about how do we break that cycle of dependency. 
And one of the ways that we can look at uh, breaking that dependency is to prioritize healthcare at a local level. Um, so that we are building the local industry um, so that we are reducing out of pocket expenditure where we are passing costs on to the individual citizens, but we are also addressing healthcare delivery systems. Uh, which we are seeing now in the vaccination programs where things are not necessarily working very well in just getting vaccines into arms. Um, and, and addressing those practical aspects as well, uh, because, you know, that will be the ultimate litmus test of success. Uh, and, and um, you know, so that we are ultimately building sustainability and breaking that cycle of external dependency. So I think I'll stop there and, uh, and, and then we can maybe go to questions. Thank you, Kriti. I think you really summed up in, in your presentation what has been a recurring theme throughout the, the afternoon uh, with regard to the external dependency, having more sustainability, having better efficiency in, 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 in national legislation, also regional value chains, and creating a much more percolated effect uh, around these issues. So I, I think we have about 15 minutes with the guidance from Sashin and uh, Ravi. 15, 20 minutes yeah, for de yeah, discussions. Yeah, definitely. So uh, it's already uh, 34. We have another uh, eight, eight minutes. Okay, so uh, there, were, there, were, there, there was one question in the chat, which I picked up, and that was about South Africa and the capacity to South Africa to, for South Africa to produce the vaccine. Does any one of the South African speakers want to actually tackle that question uh, in terms of capacity? Um, and, and of course, just in terms of where the president has been very, he's been almost non-negotiable on the issue of trips and the waiver. I'm not sure if um, people have seen the, the question in the chat in the Q and A. Is the question about our ability to produce vaccines uh, from the vaccine substance? To uh, I think it's a very it's a very broad question. Let me read it out to you, Kirti. Why we do not see South Africa either developing a, a vaccine or preparing to manufacture one? Should there be a possibility as South Africa has vaccine? And I'm not sure what MFG capability stands for. Yeah, so like I was saying, you know, our uh, vaccine manufacturing capability is predominantly um, in the latter part of the value chain, which is the fill and finish. We do have some limited capability in terms of the active substance. Uh, through the BioVac Institute. Um, and, you know, there is room for opportunity to further develop that. And I know that there are some discussions and, and developments in that area, but nowhere near, you know, the capacity that we would need, for instance, in terms of uh, producing vaccines to uh, the point of uh, fulfilling the needs of a national vac vaccination campaign. But, you know, again, these are opportunities that we need to be leveraging again in terms of investment in R&D, uh, like I said, preventing the leakages in intellectual capital and then further investment in, in terms of talent so that we can get there. Uh, in, the, in the medium to long term. Okay. Um, anyone Please else? Wants if to... I could make a brief addition to what Kirti has said. Please do. Please do. So first, I think it's important to clarify, and you know, I know that this has been uh, mentioned, that uh, in fact there is uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity on the African continent. It's just that in the vaccines area that you know we are sort of short. So I think that's quite important because I mean, in a sense, you know, South Africa has got a major thing. There's big, you know. Uh, uh, capacity across the continent. Uh, <clears throat> just to say that I concur with what Kirti is saying in that, you know, we have two major in South Africa uh, uh, so-called uh, potential vaccine manufacturers, Aspen and BioVac. BioVac has been in the game for uh, about 25 years or so, has not really, um, you know, 
actually manufactured the vaccine, but is doing really the late stage, you know, pull and finish uh, kind of work, as is Aspen on the um, um, J and J vaccine. Right. Uh, what we hear is that BioVac is in uh, the process of finalizing. Uh, they, they they engage in a, a clinical trial with the I think U.S. company to produce a vaccine locally with ultimately sort of full technology transfer and so on. So that's what seems to kind of be in the air. Um, the cost of setting up a uh, vaccine manufacturing plant, we told enormous biovac uh, CEO said something like 18 billion and five to eight years or something to do it. I'm sure it can be done uh, in, in less the time uh, given the you know exigency of situations. But uh, yeah, I think that's really what, what, what we have. So nobody is actually able to do that at this point or for the immediate future. And I think that's why the dependence is still there on other producers. Thanks. Thanks, Yusuf. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Yusuf, you had another question in the chat. Uh, I think you responded to the attendee uh, just on the role of the TRIPS and the WTO. And you actually made a point there, if you can expand on it, about how the World Health Organization could also be a critical institution in this whole discussion and, and engagement. Okay, very briefly, um, what we need to do is to avoid what actually happened after Doha and what happened with the paragraph uh, six, uh, you know, decision out of which uh, Article 31 this came about. So basically what happened, it was a uh, especially the uh, paragraph six uh, decision, which uh, you know emerged as Article Thirty One bus eventually, was a result of compromises that happened at the WTO, given the geopolitics and all the balance of political forces and so on, uh, and that then meant that we got a less than acceptable uh, solution. I mean, you know, my good friend Faisal might <laughs> disagree with me. This is the this is the trouble with having two lawyers on the panel. You see, anyway, so um, yeah. So I think what we need to do is to avoid those kinds of situations. And as long as it remains within the entire control of the WTO machinery, uh, it's going to be subject to the same pulls and pushes and so on. So one needs to actually expand the, the base of, of, of the management of this process after this thing. So I think one is looking at something more like a WTO, WHO, possibly other kinds of you know, room for non-governmental organizations, uh, South and so on, possibly to engage in, in some kind of oversight and monitoring of that sort of process. Uh, this is just thinking of the top of my head, but I think one needs to sort of broaden that in order to get the kind of public health impact that we want to see and not just, you know, a trade issue resolved in, in typical trade manner. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I don't know, Session, uh, Ravi, do you want to ask anything? Um... Uh, maybe I think, uh, Sanusha, it would be good to, uh, uh, to bring in uh... Uh, Professor Fazil Smile at this point, and yeah. also uh, uh, Carlos Correa, uh, if he has any question. But definitely to, to uh, 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 Professor Fazil Smile, my question would be how we can actually concretize uh, the capacities for the South. And, and, and I wonder whether uh, Professor Correa would like to ask uh, this question further uh, in some other way uh, to, to, to Professor Fazil. So, Carlos, uh, can we turn to you if you would like to mention something that uh, Professor Fazil should respond to? Well, thank you, Sachin. Let me make a few comments. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. were excellent. Uh, they provide a lot of information and very, very important insights. So the first comment is about the the efficacy of the waiver. We, we need to, we need to know that the waiver will just free uh, members of WTO from possible complaints from other members, but there will be a need to, uh, as it was mentioned, domesticate the waiver at the national level. In some cases, this may need um, executive power by by the administration. It may be, it may need amendments to the law. One important thing is what the courts will do in case there is an alleged infringement of a patent, even if a waiver was, was granted, there may be still the possibility for the right holder to go to the court and ask for a provisional measure to stop production. So these are things we need to look at, including also the impact of free trade agreements. The country have uh, signed up free trade agreements. There may be provisions in the agreements which will not be automatically waived in a decision made in, in WTO. 
and also uh, maybe um, an another threat could come from the BITs, the bilateral investment treaties, because there might be a possibility for uh, the right owner to say that if a patent is not enforced, there is a violation of the investor rights. As you know, intellectual property is one of the assets which are covered under most by IT. So South Africa has taken a very good policy in this regard, but most developing countries are still subject to this kind of agreement. So that, that's just one important comment. Perhaps for further deliberations, we need to look at how the waiver can be effectively implemented. So regarding the, the, the question about what can be done in South Africa or other um, African countries in, in terms of uh, techno technological capacity. In this regard, I would say that, of course, the, the lack of know-how or the, the need to get the know-how has been mentioned uh, very often. And certainly the transfer of know-how by the companies that currently produce vaccines will facilitate a lot, will accelerate a lot production in other units, in other facilities. But what I would say is that this will not be impossible even in the absence of such voluntary transfer of technology in particular for those companies which have uh, experience in biologicals they can repurpose the plants which are doing biologicals in order to produce vaccines this may take more time as compared to the situation where the transfer technology is done but this can be done in particular for vaccines which are made on the basis of traditional technologies not the messenger RNA, which is the most uh, recent technology. Although also in this case, I think there is uh, some myth that this is too complex that no developing countries facilities could engage in that. In fact, uh, now we have in Thailand, in China, in India, mRNA vaccines, which are under development. Uh, the technology is not so new, was developed in the, in the 90s by University of Pennsylvania. So I think there is not an absolute obstacle. In this regard, I think it might be interesting to look at the history of one country, uh, Cuba. Cuba was a mono producer of sugar. And then Cuba, on the basis of uh, political decision, they developed a very strong bi biotech industry. And they were able to even innovate. They have produced original vaccines. So this shows that it's not impossible. And this sense, uh, an area in which you have worked so much. South-South cooperation could be the, the, the tool. South-South cooperation might provide the, the, the response. And finally, if you still allow me a comment regarding these donations which are uh, announced by, by the G7 and also the 50 billion donation has been announced by IMF and others recently, if just 10% of these 50 billion were allocated for increasing production capacity in developing countries, that will make such a huge change in terms of uh, overcoming this current situation of, uh, of uh, shortage of supply. So these donations uh, can be seen as a generosity. It can also be seen as an outcome of pragmatism because uh, everybody recognizes that you need to control the pandemic everywhere because otherwise, as we know, these variants may, may arise out. But what we need is more than charity. What we need is more than this generosity of pragmatism. We need uh, the, to generate the capacity to expand local production of uh, vaccines and other biologicals and medicines in developing countries. I think this is the great opportunity to deal with that. Uh, so uh, my, uh, my, 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 my own view is that we should not be as pessimistic as, as many, including in particular pharmaceutical, big pharmaceutical industries telling us this is impossible, forget about this. Without, without our help, you cannot do anything. I think this is not correct. And I, I, I certainly have confidence in the scientific capacity in many developing countries and also through some -so cooperation, this could be done. Thank you, thank you, Carlos. I think, uh, uh, as Anusha would highlight, uh, uh, Dr. Amaka Wani has also made this very important point of uh, end of transition period uh, in July 2021 for TRIPS, uh, particularly at time of pandemic uh, that uh, Africa is grappling with and the world is grappling with. So, with these two comments, uh, Sanusha, with your permission, I uh, 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 request. Uh, Professor Faisal to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I really enjoyed the um, discussion by all the colleagues. Um, and uh, I'd like to, you know, really sum the, the current period up as a, 
you know, a real advance from where we were 20 years ago when we launched um, the Trips on Public Health campaign, you know, at Doha. Because then we had our back against the wall. Remember, 38 companies took us to court. <laughs> they they said, uh, you know, they held the, the patent system was sacrosanct because, of course, it was a, a major rent, you know, for the developed countries and they didn't want to give it up. Um, now, with COVID, there is a change, at least in the perception of people around the world, that health is a systemic issue. It is one that affects all of us and that we have to invest in this uh, together as a, as a global community. So that's something new. And they are, you know, have their back against the wall. So thanks to our colleagues in Geneva, you know, who we'll raised the issue of the waiver, they have created a debate um, globally and they're, they're, you know, the Euro developed countries are embarrassed, really, at um, what is a stark inequity that we see. Um, so that's that's a good start. <laughs> so the second thing is the waiver. I mean, from my experience, because I was really uh, involved in the text-based negotiations, I don't think this waiver is going to be very helpful. At best, uh, it. At best, uh, I think it is necessary to remove the legal um, uh, uh, challenges that could come from the developed countries um, against uh, poor countries and developing countries that want to um, begin to try and produce. But um, it would be useful because I think that it will push back um, the uh this pressure from from developed countries uh i do think though that we must at the global level we must push on with the debate that carlos korea and others started you know over 20 years ago in all those global commissions and you know in the who in untad in, in in many places that debate must continue um we must push it further we must assert the right of um of of uh, uh, people around the world uh, to health, the right to health. That is uh, very critical. And uh, we must change the, our approach to public health. So sometime in the history, um, you know, uh, the last few decades, we, we subcontracted public health to the private sector because they do all the R&D, <laughs> all the new diseases, all the new, you know, uh, solutions are coming from, we've subcontracted to the private sector, but this really is a public sector responsibility. We should be collectively, uh, as, a, as a world community, we should be putting um, our, our resources into innovation, R&D and innovation for public health diseases. And it's our best uh, option because otherwise we're going to be, you know, riddled with problems on patents and then, you know, finding ways of finding flexibility. And, and, and so, so we, we, we have to do this um, and it will then create, we, you know, we'll have to review the, the patent law, both at the national level and, uh, and then of course at the global level, the TRIPS agreement, we, it must be reviewed uh, as a whole because it's not helpful. And again, this point was made repeatedly in many global commissions, but it has to be made again <laughs> this time. <laughs> it has to be made again because there is a new awareness. There's a new generation of people who are now uh, aware of this. And, and we do have other systemic challenges on, in the world, like climate change. You know, we have to work on these things together. So let's put it back on the agenda. Let's review the patent system. And, and then I think um, the key in my mind is that um, resilience in public health is going to come from the sharing of technology so that production is global. Why should a, a whole continent like Africa with over 1.2 billion people, um, you know, import 99% of its vaccines? How can it be possible? How can it be possible? So this is a systemic problem it's a global problem and therefore we must spread the technology 
if you want resilience against uh, public, uh, uh, you know, pandemics uh, like this one, because others are going to come as well. So to prevent or to, to be prepared for future pandemics, we need to spread the technology and the capability of, for manufacturing uh, 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 in developing countries where the major populations are. That has to be a political awareness, a narrative. You know, we've got to fight that narrative. So that must be our next step. We must make the call for production capabilities to build global public health resilience uh, to be the technology to be shared and steps to be taken to build um, manufacturing capability. I think that's my final point. The place to start is between ourselves. So, hey, you know, since I started working at WTO 20 years ago, we have grown. The capabilities in the developing world has increased um, massively. Um, so let's work with our partners in the South. Uh, India and China produce, uh, you, know, um, the, 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 you know, the major part of APIs in the world. There's a, there's a technological capability. We have shown in South Africa, our scientists are amongst the best in the world. We, we were able to identify the variants, you know, in South Africa, even before, I'm told, you know, the British did. <laughs> but anyway, that's not a big issue. The point is that our scientists are on par, you know, with the best scientists in the world. So we do have capacity in some parts of the value chain, not in all. Let's share it, you know, in the South. Work with China, which is a, also has huge capabilities because we will need not just the technology, also need finance. And we have the BRICS Bank, we have you know, new institutions with the resources. Um, and let's work together to start seeing how we can build, you know, let's, let's identify a few pilot projects, you know, uh, in this next um, a few months, working together, bringing our private sectors together, public policy officials and NGOs, let's talk about it. And let's see if we can identify a few pilot projects to manufacture, at least in some parts of the value chain. And, you know, let's make a start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faisal. I mean, I think you've given us lots of things to think about, and especially partnerships that the RIS will want to take forward um, and convening power that this can, can bring together. I, I don't have any of the, we have about two minutes uh, before we have to bring this this incredible session to an end, and I don't think anybody wants to stop talking about it. Uh, but we have about two minutes. So uh, if uh, any of the other speakers want to just make some last minute remarks. Um, Can I take about one minute of that time, uh, Senator? You are most welcome to do so, Prof. Okay. okay, so since this is a focus on Africa, then I think I just want to make some comments about, you know, what, what can happen and what can be generated from Africa in the hope that the people on this uh, uh, webinar who do have the ears and eyes and so on of people there. Uh, so I just wanna say that this is, you know, we've been going through this for about a year and a half now. Uh, there've been a lot of webinars early in the pandemic. Uh, a lot of the focus in the, within the AU was around local manufacturing, how to get local manufacturing, how to get financing for that, right? And of course, this was largely driven by, you know, FAP, FAP pharmaceutical uh, group and so on. Which is fine. I mean, that was the interest, and that's where a lot of the talk was, where Africa ex, ex uh, import export bank came in, and so on. But I think it was only with the increasing role of the Africa CDC, which played a very seminal role here, that you started to see a focus on IP as a major barrier. But prior to that, these issues were raised, and they were never, you know, sort of taken up. So, and I think the kick for that came from the waiver proposal that India and South Africa launched at the WTO. So I think that's a very significant sort of development that we mustn't lose sight of. And I think what we need to do is to then actually consolidate the tremendous energy and solidarity and unity that you know, we have got within the African group uh, around the sort of waiver proposal, but not it, let it fizzle out like in you know, the previous instances, but to consolidate it and to go forward on a more programmatic sort of basis. Um, I think that we, all, we need more policy coherence between capitals and, and emissions in, in Geneva. I mean, you hear the, you know, emissions were leading the capitals, I think, because they were way ahead in terms of that. And many countries only came on board sort of after that. 
Uh, and perhaps uh, a very urgent AU level health trade summit that needs to look at how we can reconfigure IP in Africa. I know that at the AFCFTA, uh, this uh, work being done, there's a draft protocol, which I haven't seen, but of course it's some of our colleagues have had some inputs in that and so on. But I think it's very important that we get that right. And if we start getting those things right, we are then going to be able to put Africa on the footing that Faison and other people have spoken about to you know, uh, ensure that local production takes off, the investment is there and all that kind of stuff. So that policy is gonna be important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Vada. Uh, I don't know if Amika and Kirti want to make any last minute. We only have about 30 seconds or a little bit less. I know I'm pushing the envelope here, <laughs> Amika. <laughs> no, everything has been said, really. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, Kirti? Um, yeah, so let me let me bring it to a close. Um, oh, Kirti, are you online? Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to say one thing, and, and uh, that is to reiterate the point that we do have the capabilities uh, on the continent. It's just a matter of mobilizing and leveraging what we already have. Thank you so much. I think um, this has been an incredible uh, discussion for me. Not that an area I focus on a lot, but it's really been an eye opener. But I also think, you know, the, the 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 first step is starting with confidence in ourselves and in our capabilities and our ability to deliver. And I think the next big issue here for us to consider in the continent, in addition to the policy coherence question and the issue of reviewing our trade protocols and institutional architecture, is how do we deal with investor dispute mechanisms on the continent as well? Are we prepared for that as we go on and we and we take the, the different aspects of the waiver and domesticate it in our national, regional, and continental frameworks? And to be able to be prepared uh, for the challenges that come down the line when big farmers decide to start challenging some of these protocols as we go forward. So I think on that note, I think there's another big conference for, for Sachin and the team to think about in that context as well, uh, the investor state dispute mechanism and dealing with the patency law in that context. Uh, because again, you know, you've got this whole interesting complexities around this dispute mechanism. So I'm going to say it was a fascinating discussion. Thank you to all the panelists uh, and the questions to the attendees that stayed on. I think you've given us an incredible amount of information to go back and percolate, digest, and think about in our respective institutions and how do we take this discussion forward and to use the term that uh, Faisal put forward is change the narrative and start changing that narrative towards a solidarity of resilience and challenging what we see as things that have become completely unacceptable in a world where we should be thinking about equity, access, and just humanity. So thank you, Session, and I hand back to, to you. Thank you. Thanks, Anusha. I would request uh, Professor Ravi Srinivas to give his closing remarks and the vote of thanks. Ravi, over to you. Yeah. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. It's a pleasure to see participants from all over the world I mean, attending this uh, webinar with a lot of interest and a lot of uh, questions are there. This is the second in this series. The first, we discussed the general issues here. We are focusing more on Africa, and it's more a learning because we are learning what are the real issues, if trips may have to be achieved, how we will be able to make the best of it, and what are the real challenges. Uh, of course, it's not a challenge of just Africa. I mean, that the, some of the issues are very common, and some of the uh, challenges are also quite common, but then there are location-specific, continent-specific, country-specific issues that need to be sorted out, and also the whole question of capacity in how do we um, make the best of it in terms of legal reforms, in terms of administrative procedures, manufacturing capacity, finance, up supply chains, logistics, and all? It's a huge complex issue, but we'll have to unravel. It is not that you know, we can simply afford to say that trip saver is where everything can be taken. Then we'll have to plan, we'll have to bring in a lot of solidarity, know how we'll have to cooperate more, collaborate more, and also ensure that our objectives are achieved in a collaborative way so that. We build up sustainable solutions rather than, you know, let's see from one pandemic to another pandemic or from one peaceful solution to the peaceful solution. In that way, this webinar and the previous webinar, they have brought us a lot of clarity and also they have brought into very sharp focus that what we need to do in the, the cut of this in the cut of the paper and how can we go about for what are the real issues we need to address. And 
One thing which is very clear is that it is doable. It is not that the once the waiver is there, we will be clueless if it is we are doable. One thing we need to have some strategies, clear understanding and idea and how to go about it. I am quite sure that the South today is not the South of the 1990s or even early 2000s. We are much more advanced, we are much more progress in terms of science, technology, capacity and everything. But it's also important that we realize that we need to work more, we need to do more in that. Having said that, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Sachin for his excellent support for this webinar series and then for his continuing uh, guidance in this. Professor Carlos Correa has always been a support and a source of inspiration and then South Center has been a very active partner with so with RIS in many of the initiatives and then it's our pleasure to work with them again and again in this. I thank Dr. Samishram Aydu for extremely handling this session and then for her, um, moderating the session in such a way that you no know, she asked questions, she provoked and probed the speakers to come up with answers and solutions. It's a real pleasure that we had you as a moderator and the chair of this session. Professor Ismail brought in a lot of advice, a lot of wisdom, I would say, based on his experience. And then he was also quite, uh, you know, very cautious in some places, but at the same time, he was very apathetic and very clear of, okay, how do we go about it, what we need to do. I, we thank you, sir, for your valuable insights and guidance, and quite sure that Nelson Mandela Go School of Governance and RAS can really work together on some of the issues you have pointed out. It's really our pleasure to work with you. I mean, lots of words of wisdom, and of course, some caution also inbuilt. Professor Vardo uh, brought in a lot of some of the very legal pertinent issues, which I think are quite relevant and quite possible that some of the things which both Professor Ismail and both Vardo have to be brought in have to be blended. The sense that we need to take some pragmatic steps, also looking at I mean, how we can work up, come up with workable solutions. And Dr. Amakamani brought in from her own work as well as what is the ground reality when it comes to know, transfer of know how, building of capacity as well as how countries in Africa are really struggling with that. Particularly, her work is a very remarkable piece because it looks at the situation in Nigeria, but then it makes a lot of compatibility between Nigeria and India. In that sense, you know, there's a lot to learn from her work, which I think is very important because when we talk of also solidarity or social cooperation, we also need to look into the imbalances or the issues that could be constraints or that could impede social collaboration in the real sense. And then Dr. Kitty brought in a lot of Pragmatism, pragmatic approach as a consultant, then as a work as someone who has worked with the corporate sector and also for another dissertation which related to the pharmaceutical regulations. So I think all the four speakers brought in a lot of insights, wisdom, and also complemented each other, supplemented in some ways. So it is a real learning experience for us. I thank the RAS technology team, uh, Mr. Shma Bhatt, and then uh, Mr. Sonia Rajan for the excellent support. In fact, they could organize it much uh, within a short uh, time because of the good support we had from them. I once again thank all the participants for their patience and then for listening and then sitting for two hours in this webinar, that too on a weekend. It's really a good pressure that I mean, some so many people are interested in having uh, attending this webinar. I thank you all once again. We have two more webinars to go, 19th and 26th. We are working uh, now on that. Soon we will be I mean, sending out information on the speakers and other details. So we look forward to having two more webinars and then more events in the future on this thing. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sanusha. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Let's be safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Love the speakers. Thank you very much. Bye.